So welcome, welcome everybody to this new episode of the podcast uh, uh, Coffee Breakdown. Uh, today we have two new guests uh, that are uh, Tim Riegert, uh, who is a researcher at the University of Maastricht, and uh, Thomas uh, Butterward, uh, who's an assistant professor at the University of Maastricht, and they're also both working at the Brightlands Plasma Lab. And now we are going to talk about that. So thank you guys for your time, actually, for uh, accepting this invitation. And I see that you have a very nice uh, uh, studio uh, written. It's also written knowledge crossing borders. So I'm looking forward to talk about knowledge crossing borders with you <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you for having us. Indeed. We even brought uh, ma matching shirts uh, today. Exactly, so, very, very professional. Uh, I really yeah, like we, it. We, can we, we managed to color match with the, the Brightlands uh, logos. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and no, now we're going to talk about that. So, but first, uh, I would like, as usual, to like let you introduce yourself uh, in a few minutes, how you get interested into this topic. And um, maybe also, what are you doing? And what also you did a little bit in the past, right? How did you arrive to this position? So maybe we start with a team and then uh, with Tom. OK. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of an atypical career. Uh, while I studied physics, I uh, started my own company as a freelance software engineer. That was a hobby that got out of hand quickly. So I became a dropout during my bachelor's. I never stopped studying, but I was spending so much time on my work that I, uh, at some point after four years, I didn't study at all anymore. So then I decided, ah, maybe I should stop paying money to the university, uh, Eindhoven University I studied. But then I figured, ah, it's not that much. Finish this bachelor, then at least I have a diploma. That went actually very well. And then I thought, oh, it's kind of fun to study physics. So then I enrolled in a, a master a, a nuclear fusion. Oh, okay. um, but then my company all of a sudden went a lot less well than it did when I was doing my bachelor. And then I, uh, uh, at some point, I was out of money, so I couldn't afford to study anymore. Oh. That's when I uh, started to work for a startup, which was uh, very nice. It was a lithography uh, startup that could print PCBs uh, with, uh, I don't remember exactly, but there were 200 lasers inside that would... Uh, okay, still in Eindhoven. Um, uh, yeah, close to one. In close to one. Okay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> but uh, if you say uh, lithography... And Eindhoven, you're yeah. almost saying ASML. Almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it didn't take long before I moved to uh, ASML to work there as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. But there I was really a software engineer. And in the beginning, when I had my own company, I was developing products. I was using physics. I was uh, feeling like an all-round engineer. Mm -hmm. And then at ASML, it's a big company, so you need dedicated responsibilities and i was just a software engineer and i enjoyed that a lot but i was missing the the the, the physics okay. or the, the, the broader spectrum so then i went back uh finishing my masters i turned it into a, a physics master instead of uh, nuclear fusion but the overlap is uh, is very uh, very big between those masters and then I did my uh, master graduation at Differ in Eindhoven. That's yeah, that's I where I we met, uh, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's also where I met Tom. That's also exactly. where we, uh, uh, I, I met my current professor, uh, Gerard van Boy. Yeah. I did my master's there. Uh, I stuck around for a bit. And then uh, beginning last year, so that's uh, 21, I moved to here to help setting up this uh, this new plasma okay. that we're going to talk a lot about. Okay, okay, very good. Okay. Uh, yes, and Tom? Yeah, so I am currently technically working in the circular engineering department, but I, uh, I guess my background is also in plasma chemistry. Okay. If I go back very, very far in time, then... Uh, Back when I was in school, I, I was really interested in chemistry. And at some point I said to my dad, I'm going to go to university to study chemistry. Okay. So don't do that. There's no money in 
chemistry, you'll just end up being a researcher. So uh, <laughs> don't be a little research. Don't be a researcher. Uh, but then it, so he said, yeah, go and study chemical engineering instead. But you studied, wait, uh, not in the Netherlands, right? Uh, where did you study? I studied, I studied chemical engineering at the University of Sheffield. Sheffield, so okay. In the UK, there's a different way you can take a degree. I, I did what's called an undergraduate master's, which is mm -hmm. basically a straight four-year master's program. Yeah. Um, so in the end of my master's research, uh, uh, sorry, towards the end of my master's project, I was, uh, you get some research projects. Uh, and, and mine was on uh, producing ozone using microplasmas for water disinfection. Mm -hmm. so I first stumbled into the world of uh, plasma chemistry. Yeah. Um, and then after that, well, I realized that was kind of the only real point in my entire degree where I didn't feel like I was sort of ticking boxes and, and just, you know, doing things because I felt like I had to, but I really enjoyed what I was doing. Um, so then, yeah, research was the obvious natural path for me because it, as I said, it was the first time I really felt some passion about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, then I decided to do, do a PhD also at the University of Sheffield. Uh, ironically, there's kind of a similar story again, where, where somebody said, hey, do you want to go and do this neat thing with lasers and, or whatever in Switzerland? And I was like, no, I'm more interested in sustainability, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I ended up doing this stuff related to CO2 utilization. Um, and initially I was going to be working on electrolysis, okay. um, but then my, my supervisor said, yeah, we're sort of understanding there's some potential for, for plasmas in CO2 conversion. And then that's mm -hmm. the trajectory that my project took. I, th I think you started this activity and it was really pioneering, right? Uh, when you started, because uh, there were like probably preliminary studies. Uh, on the topics, uh, first experiments and so on, uh, besides the Russian ones that are very old, right? Yeah, so when I first started my PhD, it was, uh, I kind of read the, this, this Friedman book, Plasma Chemistry. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and, and I read these, uh, these promises about CO2 utilization and, and yeah, basically in the start of that book, he says, really, plasma is that, he actually says it's a magic wand for uh, <laughs> the, the modern technology industry or something like that. And uh, and so, and he uses specifically that example of CO2 utilization. So that was kind of a hook, I guess, that, that brought me into this field. But yeah, so my initial work was on plasma catalysis. Okay. Putting catalysts inside these dielectric barrier discharge reactors. Um, and that field is kind of a, a complicated mess. Um, it's, uh, it's <laughs> basically there's a really complicated interaction between plasma and catalyst. And, and basically my PhD became about trying to disentangle some of these complications and, and work okay. out what's really going on. Uh, so that was when I sort of started working in this like plasma diagnostic type type thing. And, mm -hmm. and then uh, because of that, I um, actually one of my, uh, uh, not bosses, but a sort of professor at the university was in contact with Herard and, and he kind of put me forward to, to this job. And said, to hey, differ? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Herald said he was looking for a, a chemical engineer okay. um, on a project with uh, Shell looking at methane reforming in uh, oh. plasma reactors. And of course, I knew a little bit about Herald at that point because uh, he was always the guy at conferences talking about vibrational excitation and all these things. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read in the in the Friedman book, and and so this this hook was kind of coming back. I I thought, okay, this is what I was really interested in: this uh, chemistry driven by vibrational excitation. This, this is my opportunity to really get to the heart of the matter. So, and that was what took me to DIFFA. Um, and then essentially in my work in DIFFA, we, we in, in terms of methane, we, we pretty much established, uh, we can talk a bit about that more later, I guess. But... Yes, yes, exactly. We talk about that topic uh, just uh, in a few minutes. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we... You threw in your own window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, kind of, uh, we kind of disproved ourselves essentially. Uh, and then I, I lost a bit of faith in the in the, the, the sort of vibrational excitation story and, and went looking for something a bit different. And uh, then that idea, I kind of wanted to leave behind the gas conversion thing. And and okay. then, uh, this opportunity opened up in, in Kaus in Saudi Arabia, where I I basically realized, okay, plasma assisted combustion, that, that must work, right? If if I if I take a lighter out of my pocket, you ignite the gas with a spark. It's a, it's already a plasma. So this has to work. 
so then I thought, okay, this is a, it's an interesting new trajectory. So yeah, I spent a, a, just less than two years in Saudi Arabia working okay. on laser diagnostics related to plasmas, but also some electric field assisted combustion in a, in a group of Professor Min Suk Shah. Okay. That was great. And then uh, at some point during COVID, Harad contacted me and said, hey, uh, we're looking <laughs> to work in this new plasma lab. Okay, yeah. okay. Then uh, let's let's jump into that, I would say, directly. So uh, can you tell us what is this uh, new lab that uh, is uh, in uh, Maastricht, actually close to Maastricht? Uh, there, is, there is Brightlands Plasma Lab. And uh, I'm asking first uh, Tom and then... Um, and um, so we, we are going to talk a lot about uh, green chemistry, plasmas, and so on. What is the difference between this lab and the ones that you worked on at DIFFER or KAUST, for example? Um, and uh, also uh, to Tim, uh, I'm very interested in how setting up a new lab, because I think it's a lot of work. It's a lot of difficult work, you know. <laughs> Um, for me, I sometimes compare it with setting up a code from scratch. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe setting up a code is easier. It requires less money for sure. <laughs> but you have I, to I go compare the two with my history as a as a software engineer. But, uh... Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's start with uh, Tom. Maybe if you can uh, introduce uh, like a few words. What is this Brightlands? Okay, so so maybe it's it's actually best to to skip past Brightlands actually because Brightlands is a is essentially a it's a collaboration between I think the University of Maastricht and the province of Limburg and actually there's a few different Brightlands campuses. Okay, okay. Uh, we're on the we're on the Brightlands Chemlock Chemlock campus and within that there's this uh, Brightsight project which we're part of. Uh, it's a little bit complicated and uh, it's easy to get lost in all of these uh, bright prefixes. Um, so yeah, in, in the Brightside Plasma Lab, we're looking at um, basically scaling plasma technologies to be used for um, the chemical industry for electrification purposes. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah. it's this is very that. sorry. This is very interesting. So in fact, uh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, I'm I'm interested. Uh, well, how plasma is beneficial also in your point of view. So what are the main applications? And then this uh, scaling up is is quite interesting uh, from research to industrial level. Yeah, so um, basically at some point a few years ago, uh, Herard was in a conversation with uh, some, some people from SABIC uh, and they basically did a sort of back of the envelope calculation and they determined that if they pyrolyze methane uh, in a plasma that, and aim to directly produce, I think, ethylene or acetylene and then hydrogenate it back to ethylene, that they would all be very rich. <laughs> uh, but... Um, and basically, what they were showing was that in, in thermodynamic terms, it's competitive with their existing industrial processes and can even and, and beat them. So um, this was essentially the, the initial motivation for this, uh, this bright cycle. Okay. So you're mainly focusing on methane conversion, from what I understood, using a plasma. Is it correct? So in the first instance, yes, our priority is on our current focus on methane conversion, but we're also doing things with, uh, we also plan to do things with uh, nitrogen. Uh, and okay. things like hydrogen vectors and whatever. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I want to go back uh, again yeah. but, uh, yeah. to Tim. Um, so you, you joined this new activity as well, right? With your previous experiences and so on. Yeah. And um, yeah, I want to go back to this question. Uh, how's uh, setting up uh, a new lab, you know? Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, yeah. So, so if we need to compare it to writing code, I, yeah. I actually prefer to start with my own code because <laughs> then, then I know what's going on and then I know nobody named the variable uh, counterintuitively. You, you know exactly what's, what's going on. Um, with a lab, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, we, we also live in a difficult time with, with uh, high delivery times of anything you like to buy. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, if, it's, if it's hard to buy a commercially available car and you have uh, 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 delivery times of uh, half a year, then uh, you can imagine what the delivery times are for very specific plasma uh, specific devices. 
Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's a lot of planning, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of improvising. Okay. It's, uh, um, I am uh, not a big fan of, of of building things out of duct tape, but uh, <laughs> you might find a <laughs> patch uh, every now and then because we need to uh, to to get this uh, lab running. Okay. Um, with, with good preparation, we were able we got the key before we had the opening of the lab because of all these delays we got the key two weeks in advance but because the planning was very right and we were working like an oiled engine together uh, we managed to to make plasma within two weeks okay uh, so, so what is the status that. now you you have uh, working uh, setups uh, where you can do actual research uh, at the moment right so we we have a working setup and actually today we finalized all the uh, paperwork that we can actually start to use methane mm -hmm. um, for until now we've been running nitrogen plasmas these are very nice to test the setup they they are nice okay. for demonstration they are nice to uh, to uh, uh, align some things just do a proof of concept mm -hmm. but the only thing you will do is you start with nitrogen and you end with hot nitrogen. So it's the most useless machine that we've <laughs> built, <laughs> that I've built in my life. But starting today, we have permission to, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an entropy machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have permission okay. to use it on methane. So, so very exciting times for us right now. Okay, okay. And uh, how do you, so you have this uh, plasma, right? Uh, so I suppose, uh, well, you have, first of all, you have a, uh, a feed uh, gas right then you form a plasma by depositing some power i think you use microwave uh, right or uh, yeah, all sort of this yeah. so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well we're, bu we're building two machines so the 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 university is and and therefore me is mainly focusing on the microwave plasma okay um that's also what what we both have experience with at the uh, maastricht Union of uh, at uh, differ Mm -hmm. uh, in Eindhoven, um, but in the meanwhile, we're also building another setup, and there the collaboration with different parties is much more pronounced. Uh, TNO is involved. Yeah. Uh, which so, other big? Oh, oh SciTech. SciTech. Oh, yeah, SciTech. Of okay. Course. Okay. So that's uh, quite in. So from what I understood, in fact, also from you know what I read and so on. So the main goal is to help uh, on the electrification, right? as you said because uh, we also had another episode on plasma chemistry in fact and uh, professor yeah. longo told us you know when you talk about plasmas you're basically talking about electricity because yeah. all these processes uh, that uh, are driven by plasmas in fact uh, are um, are led by the availability of electricity yeah. so because you can flow a current to a plasma in fact and so these yeah so i, I think that's that's um the main selling point of plasma chemistry there's lots of benefits that for plasma chemistry uh, compared to traditional chemistry mm -hmm. but the the, um, the fact that they run on electricity is big mm -hmm. so when the first electric cars came around people were complaining like yeah but but now there's a factory creating the uh, emissions instead of uh, from the exhaust of the car you yeah. just move the problem but that's not true because as we're going through this energy transition, uh, we are in the middle of it. And uh, if you, if I ask you to name some some sustainable resources for energy, it's all electric. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The solar, uh, the wind, and so on—they produce electricity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So also so, nuclear, if we want to include it. Exactly. In, uh, yeah. Exactly. In the end, all the new energy sources, all the sustainable energy sources. Yeah are going to be electric yeah but still we need chemicals right uh, still we need uh, yeah yeah sure exactly yeah, yeah. so so not so not every application of a plasma machine might be uh, completely green or completely sustainable mm -hmm. uh, but by by electrifying the process you are uh, getting ready for green energy and you're getting ready for, for, for machines that can be powered by green energy and don't rely on gas or oil uh, in the case of 
yeah. uh, endothermic uh, chemistry. So that's that's okay. the main selling point for plasmas for me. Okay. <laughs> then um, I have a, I have a question uh, uh, for Tom and then uh, for you, Tim. Um, so you know when, when I think about the experiments uh, and this is something so research and especially if you want to scale up. I think we have to think about different levels of feasibility, right? So scientific feasibility, first of all, but we know that we know that we can use a plasma and with plasma can dissociate this molecule. Technological feasibility, and this is what you're demonstrating, right? Building up this new lab and so on. The fact that you don't employ scarce materials and so on. And the third is the economical feasibility, right? In terms of energy efficiency. So can you comment on that? Uh, so first of all, are we interested in energy efficiency more or more in the yield? So how much products you produce? It's a really good question, actually. So, so if you think from the perspective of methane plasma, so what we would really like to do is go directly to produce ethylene, which is C2H4. It's a okay. chemical that's used to produce plastics. Um, but what happens basically if you paralyze methane at high temperature is you predominantly produce acetylene and hydrogen. Okay. Um, so what you could do is hydrogenate this acetylene to go back to ethylene, uh, but in the end, that, that's an energy cost. Um, yeah. But basically, if we want to try and produce ethylene, actually what we see is if we start going down that route, it's not selective. Uh, and you end up producing not just uh, ethylene, but also acetylene is inevitable, uh, but you also produce other things like benzene and so et cetera. And then this makes things a bit complicated because it's not just the question of the energy efficiency of the plasma process, but also the, the other things that come around it. So, so what's really interesting is we're, we're talking about this scale up. So going from our lab scale, three kilowatts, this DC arc that we're also working on, which is 50 kilowatts. And the next scale beyond that is 500 kilowatts. And, and we're building a, well, I say we, uh, part of our, the, the MOI project that we're part of is, uh, is to build a, a 500 kilowatts um, uh, pilot scale methane pyrolysis system. Okay. In that instance, when you see how this thing, you, there's a video tool that's available that you can see in there. It, it shows the ev everything in the lab and the, the plasma reactor, you can easily miss it. To us, it's the most important part, but it's just, there's two floors of this building. It's huge. There's loads of massive elements everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the plasma reactor is, I, I don't know, the, the business part of it is about the size of this water bottle. Okay. And surrounding that, there's massive pumps, separation, oh. this hydro catalytic hydrogenation, all sorts of other, other stuff. And that's where the, the, that's where the money is, uh, is really going. It, you know, the, the, the price mm -hmm. of the plasma source is tiny compared to the expense of a pump that can handle yeah. a satellite. <laughs> uh, so yeah we obsess as plasma chemists a bit over energy efficiency but what's really important is yeah the, the complete picture the co conversion selectivity that the whole thing and um yeah exactly exactly because you have other stages after the the conversion yeah, after exactly. the plasma part that, that's true that's is to be taken uh tim you have something to add uh, actually to this topic uh, what do you think about this problem of um, energy efficiency of yeah this plasma? Yeah, so um, I used to care about energy efficiency a lot more than I do now. Uh -huh. uh, for me, it was the magic number. Get that number as high <laughs> as possible and you, you get the price. Uh, but indeed, uh, with age comes uh, knowledge. Um, it's 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 not a holy number because in the you need to separate the gas that, yeah, that's yeah. also uh, uh, priceful, but it's also um, it's not completely true for the for the very big pilot or demo plants that we're we're, we're going to build, but for smaller setups, uh, the fact that that a plasma is switched on and switched off with a snap of a finger is also added value. So you can imagine that if all of the sudden there's a lot of excess energy on the grid. If we talk about the, the, the future of, of the grid uh, um, uh, and, and uh, there's locally a lot of wind and you, you end up with a lot of electricity, if you are just able to, to convert with efficiency of 30%, you are using this excess energy if you try to store that energy that also has an efficiency cycle, uh, uh, et cetera. So that's, that's for me, um, 
yes, we try to go for a high efficiency, but no, even with a low efficiency, there's lots of benefits that, that a plasma setup has compared to traditional chemistry where you have to get the 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 engine running get get it heated up and it takes a few hours before the 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 plant is started up um and that's in the short term so that we can react quickly on, okay. on the changes in the grid uh the second part is once this this uh, uh engine is is running you you can do heat reintegration so, uh, well, energy is conserved, as we all know. So, so, so if, if the efficiency is not high, that means we have a hot gas. Yeah. If we can use, reuse that heat in the gas that we feed in, we can artificially uh, increase the energy efficiency. Okay, okay. So there is a larger room. Uh... I'm worried about uh, efficiency. Okay. I'm starting to focus more on selectivity. Yeah, and the, the yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, this is a bit of a change of uh, perspective because in most of the papers I've read, uh, we care about having this efficiency higher than 50, 60 percent, right? Yeah. But uh, I know a lot of, uh, not a lot, but I know examples of, for example, plasma applications where the energy efficiency is not the only things that matter. In fact, like think about uh, these uh, neutral beam injectors for fusion, you know, these ICP sources that they want to produce uh, negative ions and then to accelerate it and extract it there and then they have to neutralize the efficiency of this process is is very low it depends on the extracted energy but uh, it does not overcome 60 percent right yeah, 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 yeah but their plasmas have a sort of uniqueness because it's in my view it's the only option to produce this negative ion with, with uh, high enough energy with high enough concentration right yeah so if uh, plasmas uh, can show that they have a sort of uniqueness also for methane or nitrogen uh, conversion or I think there, there is potential, right? I also feel uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm criticizing uh, my, my own field now, but let, let's make it, make it more widely mm -hmm. criticize science in general. There's a lot of focus in, on energy efficiency. That's okay. not only in, in plasma papers uh, uh, for, for microwave plasmas, what, 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 where we work in, but also the, 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 the Q infusion reactors, like, ah, we reached the yeah. uh, Q 1.1, but you're ignoring all the computers, all the systems around it, all the, the cooling of, of, of the, the magnets of, of a fusion reactor. If you would all take that into account, then the real Q is 0 0.01. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, the same is with, with research on plasma reactors. It's nice that in a lab, under very controlled conditions with very pure gas, you can get an energy efficiency of 60%. But what about the pump? What about the efficiency of your microwave? What about all the equipment that's around it to, to maintain a safe running re okay. reaction? These, I, I see that these microwave reactors that we work on mm. are much more valuable in providing us information about the plasma chemistry than this whole game of who can get the highest efficiency. Of course, okay. we should make an efficient machine, so we sh should not lose track of it. Yeah, yeah because uh, still uh, we have to remind yeah. that electricity probably is never going to be completely free. Yes, no, you have no. excess, but uh, you still pay yeah. for it, right? No, so, and it, it's a big win. If you like, it, it's still money if you can do twice the amount uh, uh, of, of work with the same amount of money or the same amount of energy, then, uh, okay. then you do that. So um, I want to go back to Tom, actually. So you mentioned these problems of selectivity, right? You want to produce certain species. How do you tackle that in a research point of view, like experimentally or in terms of models and so on? Um, I, uh, How do you yeah. tackle the issue of selectivity? Well, yeah, this is obviously one of the big, big questions that we're trying to deal with. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, previously, th there was a lot of interest in this chemistry driven by vibrational excitation. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. yes. Just disproved that that's likely to be uh, important in microwave plasmas. Yeah, there was a, a sort of, even there, uh, I noticed during my PhD, really a change of perspective, right? 
we thought that dissociation of molecules in this type of plasma was, was led mainly by this mutual interaction between vibration excited. Yeah. And then uh, together with our colleagues, uh, you know, we, we found uh, that uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's actually mainly driven by other processes like high gas temperature, right? Yeah. Probably the gas flow and so on, they play all a role in this, uh, the power deposition and so on. So exactly so, so that was kind of one of one of the sort of driving points for me to to move away from that field but but now uh, returning to it uh, basically the the idea that we're toying with currently is the idea of essentially chemical non-equilibrium so um actually what really happens if you let methane equilibrate at 2000 kelvin uh, you reach a thermodynamic equilibrium if you if you cook it at that temperature is you end up producing carbon and hydrogen um, and the Huels process, which was developed, I think, over a century ago, um, basically that works on paralyzing methane on, with very short resonance times. So you don't allow it to reach an equilibrium. Um, and the Huels process goes from uh, methane to acetylene. And it does that. The whole process takes around a millisecond. Um, so you have these very, very short resonance times. So essentially, it's a chemical non equilibrium. Mm -hmm. What we're going for now is the idea of taking that one step further and uh, trying to get sub millisecond resonance time. So down to hundred microseconds. And the hypothesis is, is that if you can do that, then you can potentially produce uh, ethylene. It's essentially one, one step before um, acetylene production. So you have this um, basically methane dissociation, you produce CHG radicals, they couple together and you sequentially uh, dehydrogenate them. So it's basically interrupting that that pathway at, at ethylene. Um, so that's the current idea to, to tackle this selectivity issue. But yeah, it, inevitably, it's not going to be perfectly selective. And uh, mm -hmm. there's definitely going to be many challenges in trying to realize that. OK. And the team, uh, which uh, diagnostics are you operating to measure all these different species or what is going on in the plasma? That's that's actually more a question for Tom, because he's our okay, okay, okay. expert. <laughs> so uh, maybe you can... Uh... Yeah, sure. So um, so the current plan is, is that we're going to be using predominantly laser scattering based diagnostics. And um, so what we were doing in DIFFA, but uh, so this is Rayleigh scattering, which you can use to measure essentially gas density from which you can theoretically measure temperature. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but... Uh, also, uh, vibrational and rotational Raman scattering, which is essentially a, a fingerprint of a molecule. So from that, you can determine uh, composition and rotational and vibrational temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, Thompson scattering, which you can use to measure electron density. Um, but there's other potential tricks that we, we might be able to implement. Um, so also possible is uh, there's a technique called Rayleigh velocimetry. Um, which is based on this Rayleigh scattering, basically measuring the, the Doppler shift of this Rayleigh line oh, with okay. used to measure uh, the local velocity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, then we get more to, to what gets me really excited. <laughs> okay, that is, uh, I'm curious. Well, well, all of us has, have studied uh, uh, microwave plasmas and, and maybe with different goals, uh, but there are still some debates or maybe not debates, but disagreements or uh, uh, different uh, mental images of how the gas actually flows through the reactor. And uh, as Tom just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, this residence time yeah, is yeah. a very important aspect of any chemical reactor, so also a plasma reactor. And uh, depending on who you ask, people guess one millisecond residence time or 150 milliseconds residence time in such a reactor. Well, that obviously can't both be true. So, so that's where, where I'm really interested uh, in. I did some work on that before, uh, but back then I thought I was doing it to optimize a microwave reactor. And now I am doing it to understand a microwave reactor such that we can apply it in an arc reactor yeah. or... Uh, yeah. And it, yeah, this is very interesting because uh, at the end, uh, uh, you know, when uh, we do research in general, sometimes we tend to um, accept uh, 
or we tend to limit ourselves to a sort of proof of principle, you know. So I develop this idea, I find it, uh, I show like some little application, but I'm satisfied by that. Yeah. Whereas you want also to optimize the problem, you know, right? Because you want to bring it at sort of industrial level, higher level. Yeah. In my view, and this is very interesting what you said, because we always talk about chemistry, that is true. So it seems like it's a sort of kinetic problem because you produce a lot of species. In yeah. my view, your problem is very much related with a transport problem, right? So you want to know how mass is transported. What is the best configuration in terms of geometry of your reactor? What is yeah. the best way to couple the power to the plasma? So, and this is all transport, uh, in fact. Um, it's like if you're building an airplane, right? Yeah, yeah, you have yeah, to model yeah. the gas flow around and so on. Of course, it's different uh, because we have a plasma That's here. The, but hit it on the head. I mean, this is, this is really... Uh... To me, I think it's kind of the, the next frontier in our research is that we yeah. really have to get to grips with this flow dynamics because it's yeah. critical to performance. And it's not just for methane, uh, also to a certain extent for CO2, uh, but also I believe in nitric oxide production, this resonance time also becomes really important. So basically for every application that we're interested in, we need okay, to know okay. more about yeah. and So can, can you tell us uh, which uh, type of research you are planning or you see it promising in this field, in fact. Uh, so you mentioned this. Uh, like, do you think, for example, studies uh, close to like what they did in combustion, they could be promising? Or uh, we could look into other fields? I th like catalysis or other things? I don't know. So, uh, so I mean, in, so in, in the kind of plasmas that we're interested in, in a, and especially I, I'm increasingly the opinion of industrially viable plasmas, they're going to have very high power densities, which means that they're, they're hot. Okay. Okay. I don't think catalysis has much of a, an opportunity in those kinds of conditions. Um, but yeah, I'd like to be proven wrong on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we can learn a lot from the combustion community. So when I was in, in this university in Saudi Arabia, Kaos, I was working in the combustion research center. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have so many tricks for measuring all sorts of parameters with uh, lasers that, that give you valuable insight. And, and I, yeah, these are, we need to learn from them and, and, and bring that knowledge into the plasma community. That's okay, nice. okay, okay. So that's also very nice of where we are situated now. Um, I, I don't think we, we call the place, but we are sitting in Geleen. That's uh, in the province of Limburg, not so far from Maastricht. So we work at the Maastricht yeah. University, but the campus is in Geleen. Uh, and this is this is a chemical site, so we are very close to the partners that actually want to use our technology, and 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 that's very nice that we can um, exchange. We're still, uh, yeah. we're still researchers. We we want to understand things, but we mm -hmm. also know and we constantly feel the pressure uh, to focus our research to uh, in an applied way like research that what what will make a plasma reactor more viable in a shorter amount of of time and okay i okay. i really i genuinely feel like you go to 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 presentations here you visit your colleagues and you know that there's uh, this is not some utopia this is happening and we are here right now to 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 optimize these reactors and to hmm. to make this change um I, i'm i'm really okay. uh, i really feel part of that that's nice okay i'm very curious uh, how's the collaboration with uh, some industrial partners i think it's different than if you work at university right where uh, you don't have this pressure of optimization probably you have also a sort of less strict uh, timelines so how's that in terms of fundings in terms of uh, you know collaboration do you find it more challenging, more exciting in that point of view? Um, what's your experience? Um, it's a good question. So at the moment, we're, as, as you know, we're, we're kind of setting up the lab and that also means setting up these uh, collaborations to a certain extent. So uh, we have many basically things on the horizon, but, but we, we don't really have, uh, let's say, weekly meetings with uh, Sabic or whatever to, to optimize this the performance of this uh, reactor or whatever we're not quite at that stage yet um 
but yeah, essentially it's it's good because we feel them all around us. And we, we I regularly have conversations with people from industry and they say, yeah, this is not going to work or this is going to work. And so it's, it's nice to always have that, that, that sort of feedback that you're on the right lines or not. And, okay. and it kind of echoes what, what Tim is saying that, that, yeah, really we feel like we're going to be hopefully making some impact of some kind and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. say whether these processes are going to work yet or not. Yeah, you're you're having we're all having lunch in the same cafeteria, so so yeah. you occasionally have lunch. Okay, yeah. with all that that fun. Is it, um, it's quite interesting because uh, I'm thinking about also like my research. Uh, sometimes I'm quite interested in sort sort of fundamental understanding. So I think it's very challenging to talk uh, uh, also to to exchange uh, to with people in industry, right? Yeah, that uh, yeah. sometimes um, you, you have to explain uh, why you need this fundamental understanding and also they have to explain their needs uh, in terms of, you know, we want uh, that the setup has this performance. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's, it's, no, it's, it's difficult it's, to combine I, the two words. Actually, I, I found mostly, so because we're a new lab in this, uh, in, in, uh, on the Camelot campus, we've had a lot of visitors recently so we have loads of people from industry coming in it's basically been a media circus which is it's kind of entertaining uh, hence why we're so good on camera <laughs> um <laughs> but uh yeah so often when we show basically i i had some conversations recently with some companies and, and we have uh, we have long discussions and there's kind of a, a bit of a feeling sometimes like yeah i don't know maybe and then and then we show them the lab and Mm -hmm. and show them our plasma and show them what we're doing and say uh and all of a sudden they're, they're really impressed and and they say okay we can see how this is working and we see the potential of it and uh and so showing them for example the laser diagnostics and explaining okay this this thing about resonance time and all these kind of things we can say yeah so with this laser we can measure the composition at this point and we can measure it again at this point and you can see that mm -hmm. you could imagine that if we interfere here in the right way we can freeze that product composition and, and yeah, yeah. of course, that resonates with them. I mean, you're telling them, I can tell you exactly what's happening inside this reactor at this point in time. And Good based on everything they do, like these selectivity ch challenges, yeah, it's not a black box anymore. You, you've, got a, you've got a route to look inside the black box. Okay. And uh, do you have a sort of a roadmap or timeline? Where, where are you planning to have a first uh, sort of mini power plant or mini, I don't know how to call it. <laughs> Maybe you can now fade to a, to a picture <laughs> that we made where we where we sh showed this timeline. Uh, okay. uh, so the, so the, we we uh, use uh, a TRL that stands for Technology Readiness Level. Um, I think it goes from one to nine, where one is an idea in your head, and nine is something that's uh, uh, commercially uh, uh, available. And uh, there's a clear timeline when it comes to the methane uh, conversion. There's a clean, uh, a clear timeline. Currently, we're doing research mm -hmm. on a one kilowatt setup. Well, we we are doing better than that. We're doing research on a three kilowatt setup. So, okay, three hundred percent value for money. Uh, and by the end of this year, but uh, realistically, let's say uh, early next year. We are doing research on a, a 50 kilowatt setup. I think that's even increased already. I uh, know it's 50, uh, 50 yeah. kilowatts. Oh, it went from 30 to 50, I think. But uh, anyway, in a, in a few years, we will uh, have our first uh, uh, demo plant. Um, I really advise you to to, to okay, keep okay. The, the, the screen over my uh, voice to okay, people okay. To see where I. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> whether I said it correctly or not, but there, there is, there is a plan ahead, and we are already making drawings for the the the, yeah. the demo plan. So this is, like I said before, general, general, exactly. Happening, but but we 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 start in parallel so that we can oh, okay. uh, tweak yeah. along our findings in 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 every stage of this. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and and when Tim says we, it's really the royal we. I, I think there's yeah yeah there's, oh, yeah. there's, yeah. there's a lot of people actually uh, how, how many people yeah are involved uh, in uh, only only plasma maybe because uh, yeah, I understand that it's really big. Uh, if we have a group outing, it's about uh, forty people. But yeah. I I guess 
uh, that's only the people who are directly involved with the plasma research. Oh wow! Okay. So that, that that means that there will be a hundred more in the background. Yeah, there's, there's people doing uh, uh, process design, life cycle assessment, all these kind of things. So uh, simulations. There's there's loads of chemical engineers involved. It's. Uh, I mean, if if you're talking about scaling up, then then you need that, right? So so. Exactly. I mean, yeah. When when we talk about we are doing the the drawings for the yeah the, yeah sure. the pilot scale it's <laughs> some, that's some, excluding me somebody yeah, somebody, excluding somebody that i don't know the name of is doing a 500 kilowatt uh, design uh, <laughs> actually it's probably zero, right? yeah. and there's, there's basically loads of people involved and in, and yeah uh, true yeah. Is, is what we said before right it is this interaction between people with different backgrounds so you need engineers you need physicists chemists and so on uh, so that's very yeah. important. Uh, okay. Uh, regarding uh, the interaction with people, I'm really curious what you think about this kind of um, um, activities to, um, to like a sort of outreach activities or popularization activities. Uh, what do you think? Uh, so do you also involve the students for like uh, internship or thesis projects uh, in your lab? And uh, yeah. So uh, we would, I mean, if any students are interested, of, of course, we'd happily try and uh, welcome that and make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, as it currently stands, so there's a new circular engineering bachelor degree that's taking place at Maastricht University, and, and that's uh, it basically attached to, to our work. Um, however, yeah, they're all first year students at the moment, so there's no opportunities for, yeah, yeah. Bachelor's for them. So, so that's something we have to invent in two years' time. Um, but yeah, if there's any anybody that is interested from Eindhoven University or or wherever to, to to try and do their thesis with them. That's obviously something we more than happily welcome. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. In, in terms of outreach activity, besides that, though, it maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but at the moment we we're so sort of wrapped up in uh, our own work. And on on top of that, we've we've also just had so many visitors to the lab. It's it's pr still pretty much once a week. Uh, so so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we have. Uh, it's, I think it's scheduled now to to have uh, the the guy that's normally organising it, Hans Linden, is uh, kind of in agreement with us. It'll only bring people once a week anymore. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think next week we're doing a film on the Friday. So we're kind of stretched out in terms of. Uh, uh, yeah, true, 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 true. I think it would be interesting. Um, let, let's see, let's see. Maybe I'll try to talk with, with different people what they think about the impact of plasma chemistry for this electrification problem for uh, this sort of green uh, chemistry problem. Um, yeah, there's, there's, I, I'm really curious about it, uh, you know, also to hear from uh, different uh, people doing yeah. different type of work. So in this respect, I think we could uh, define a sort of, you know, definition of the impact of plasma chemistry in this field. Uh, I think that would be interesting. Concerning the outreach, if anybody is watching this video and uh, is looking for also a phd or a postdoc um it's uh, it, it never hurts to uh, contact us because uh, okay okay i'll put the link or we can, your address yeah. in the description of the video if you want and um, yeah sure yeah so they can contact you or see the website of your lab uh, and so on your institute okay um, do, do you have something else to add before uh, concluding the video no, I was just going to say that actually, uh, in terms of outreach, we, we normally have this gliding arc reactor that we stole from Differ. So if anyone from Differ wants it back, then uh, you, can, <laughs> you can come and get it. <laughs> okay. But besides that, yeah, I, I just want to yeah, echo exactly what Tim said. So yeah, we always need bright people. But on top of that, we have a, a few opportunities available at the moment. So we're looking for yeah, I think two PhDs and one postdoc, but really okay. the lab is growing quickly. So yeah, if you see this video, then that means you're already the right, potentially the right, likely the right person for the job because you uh, you know about plasma science, then uh, then send us your CV. Yeah, uh, and okay. uh, so master students, uh, bachelor students. Technicians. And if you're looking for a nice bachelor to do, uh, have a look at the circular engineering bachelor that's uh, given that. In Maastricht uh, University. Okay. University. We are not, uh, it, it's not owned by us, but we share the same name. So we have a big responsibility in that uh, bachelor. And both of us are also teaching in that bachelor. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, guys. It was an interesting conversation for me. And yeah, um, have a nice day and uh, see you soon. Bye.
Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye. bye.